analysis of your workload, such as for dependencies. Um, refine your business case uh, and start making the plans for your migration. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, earmark those people, a group of people that's going to be your center of excellence so that they can acquire all the skills so that they can go ahead and feed that back into the organization, um, making sure that your data is secure and it's, everything that you're doing is in compliance with your companies and industries uh, compliance requirements. And then validate the plan and validate the skills by doing a proof of concept. Uh, start small and then acquire your experience and do it safely. And sometimes uh, ask for help, right, uh, by the third party providers. There you go. Right, so that is the MRP. Now let's move into the next section. Uh, which is about learning about the common application migration strategies. Okay, now it used to be called the 6R um, uh, migration strategies, but it's actually now called the, um, uh, well, it's, it's a seven step, right? It's not seven R's, but it's a seven step. Now there's actually one additional step that's been added. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. All right, so application migration strategies. Okay, so the application migration strategies, um, it's, you know, it's it's usually called the six R's. I put seven R's in there, but the last one is not an R. <laughs> OK, but anyway, so there is a rehosting, replatforming, repurchasing, refactoring, retiring, retaining and hybrid. OK, um, and uh, I'll go over each and every one of these things. Now, what you see on the left hand side, this is a picture uh, from a reinvent. Uh, and this one only has the six, right? Because a hybrid is a combination of any uh, any of these things. And this slide, although it's not too clear, uh, unfortunately, uh, it does have the time that's required to do every one of these things and the cost involved uh, and also the uh, the agility involved, right? Um, so uh, as you see uh, from the rehosting, uh, to let's say for re-architecting, the difference is you know more time, perhaps more money, uh, you know more agility. That means more flexibility that you have. Okay, so so we'll keep the the picture on the left as we go through each and every one of these uh, strategies. All right, so let's go with the first one, uh, which is rehosting. Now rehosting uh, is sometimes called lift and shift. Okay, lift and shift uh, because rehosting, by the way. Uh, is I think is the most common way that a lot of customers move into AWS initially. OK, so the initial move, remember, you know, taking the, the low risk, uh, small scale, you know, step by step process. Um, rehosting is really good with that because rehosting lift and shift is you have workload on premises. You're lifting that out from its physical you know, servers, and then you're shifting it uh, right into AWS and dumping it in AWS, right, so to speak, okay? So if you have a Linux server on premises, you're going to spin up a Linux server on the AWS side, virtual machine like EC2, and then you move your application or reinstall your application uh, as exactly as you have it in on premises right into AWS. So nothing really changes other than the server itself. You just shed the physical server, right? Uh, and you move in. So, um, so that means yes, you move, you're moving into the cloud, and yes, it's uh, the least risky way for you to move into the cloud. But it's not the one where if you, you the strategy that you would take if you want to take the most advantage of the cloud, right? But that could come later. So anyway, so that's basically what a lift and shift is, right? So you're just moving application and it's associated data uh, with little or no modification right into the cloud. So that's called the rehosting. Okay. So if you look at the left hand side, the picture, the rehosting is where you see the blue uh, vertical line. And yes, of course, it does take time uh, because you do have to, uh, you know, uh, set up the environment in AWS and then you have to move the application. So you still have to do that move. The agility wise, you're going to get the advantage of scalability, uh, the 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 you know, and also having the backups on different locations and such. So yeah, you're going to get the agility uh, and uh, it's relatively, uh, you know, low risk. Okay, uh, but it's not it's not going to necessarily take 
advantage of the cloud because your application was meant for on-premises, not for the cloud, right? But it's still going to work. And a lot of companies actually do this as their first step into the migration. The next one is called replatforming. <clears throat> replatforming is sometimes called lift, tinker, and shift, right? So what you're doing is you're actually making few, just very few cloud optimization, okay? Um, for your benefit, okay? But you're not really changing the application or the core architecture of the application, right? You're just kind of taking advantage of just a little pieces uh, of something that, you know, uh, the cloud offers that you don't have on-premises. So for example, let's say that on-premises, you have your uh, application in a Oracle database, let's say, right? Or, or your application is using Oracle database. Well, uh, AWS actually has something called the RDS, Relational Database Service, where you don't have to actually install uh, your Oracle. Uh, AWS will do that for you, for example, right? Um, but your application is still using Oracle. That hasn't changed, right? Architecture hasn't changed. It's just that, you know, the Oracle application resides in a separate uh, service rather than a server that you set up for yourself. So there you go. So it's a just a tinkering a little bit, right? Just a little tweak uh, to take advantage of the cloud. Yeah, so this is still not that much risk because you're not going into something that's vastly different or you're re-architecting. Anyway, so the next one is repurchase, drop and shop. So this involves the um you know use moving to a, the totally different products altogether right typically you're moving from something that's running on on premises into saas solution right so software as a service solution so uh, just to kind of help you visualize what this might look like i gave you some examples here one two three four five examples uh on what this could be so let's go ahead and take a look at it right uh let's say you have uh, microsoft sharepoint servers uh, in your on-premises, and let's say you move that to Amazon WorkDocs, right? So that would be a SaaS application, or local data warehousing to Amazon Redshift. Redshift is a SaaS application. Uh, On-premises managed, uh, you know, Active Directory into a AWS managed Microsoft Active Directory, right? So it's, it's a little bit different because it's not on-premises, it's actually uh, Active Directory in the cloud, so it does have some different features, but you know it will support, it is compatible with the, um, the Active Directory that is on-premises. Switching from on-premises CRM, uh, Customer Relationship Management, to AWS Connect for Customer Relationship Management, okay? Uh, and also low, you know, replacing local backup system with AWS Backup, um, so there you go. Different systems, it still does the same functionality, but it is a totally different system altogether. So that is a repurchase okay, uh, option. Okay. And the next one is refactoring. Now, refactoring is also re-architecting. Now, this one is the most involved uh, because it does require you to change things, right? You may have to actually rewrite your code. Uh, so that, but the point is, why are you rewriting your code? To take the full advantage of the cloud. And when your application is taking full advantage of the cloud, that is usually called cloud native applications. Right? Cloud native applications. Now, cloud native application has, you know, many um, features about it. One of the major feature is something called microservices. So if you have a one big you know, application on premises, that's usually called a monolith application. But to take the most advantage of the cloud, such as auto scalings and, you know, the serverless architectures, you want to break those into uh, pieces, smaller pieces called microservices. And by the way, this is not trivial, right? Uh, breaking the mic uh, monolith into microservices are not trivial. It's not just about saying, oh, okay, three pieces. No, right? It does take a lot of effort. Uh, and it also has Sometimes you can't do it, right? Depending on the application, you can't break them into pieces. So there are certain workloads that you won't be able to do this with. But if you can do this, this is great. In fact, if you're not migrating, but you're creating something for the first time in the cloud, yeah, create it so that you know you are creating these um, uh, cloud native applications. But if you want to migrate a non-cloud native into cloud native, that's going to take a lot of effort. OK, so if you look at the the uh, the uh, the 
the, the image on the left hand side, you see the refactor. So the refactor is that brown piece, right? It takes the most time, right? It takes the most amount of cost, right? But it has the highest agility because it's taking the most advantage of cloud features, okay? So you don't have to go here from zero, right? That means you could do a re-hosting first, that is to uh, lift and shift, right? Then you could actually re-platform uh, next because re-hosting and re-platforming is pretty close together. Then after a while, after you get used to how these things are working, then you say, okay, maybe, right? Maybe we could start thinking about refactoring this, right? So it could be in steps that, you know, that's highly recommended that you don't take, you don't really grab a big chunk uh, because there is risk, especially if you've never done it before, right? So there you go. But refactoring takes the most advantage. It is the cloud native uh, features using microservices and auto scaling. There you go. Okay. All right. So the next one, though, is as you're looking through and taking inventory, you say, you know what, what is that? What is that thing at the corner on the corner of the uh, the data center that's kind of gathering dust? Oh, right. So, you know, you now identified an IT system that you haven't really been using and, you know, you've actually, you know, maybe you don't need it anymore, right? So if it's no longer useful, maybe this is a great time for you to do some house cleaning, decommissioning, toss it out, okay? So that means you can reduce, uh, your cost, uh, and you don't have to go through the effort of trying to say, okay, do we have to move this thing right into the cloud? Uh, no, because nobody's using it, right? Or it's, you know, it's it's not being used, uh, you know, to that degree. So there you go. So you may want to retire it, and you know, you may want to take advantage of taking this particular application and then recreating it in the cloud using cloud native uh, approach, right? And that's an option. And the next one here, this is the last of the R's, is to retain. Some applications you cannot move into the cloud. And there are a lot of reasons why, okay? One reason is, well, uh, there is no uh, compatible service or platform uh, for your servers, right? Um, some labeled as legacy system, main mainframe systems and such. Yeah, those things, you may not be able to move from right to left. Okay, so he said, okay, <laughs> let's consider that later. Let's just keep that working on premises and we'll come back to it later, okay? You may have some regulatory constraints that says, no, we can't move that system into the cloud, right? And you just never know, right, in your industry. So check that out. Um, and some very specialized hardware uh, that you can recreate. Although with the uh, high performance computing, there are some options within AWS, but you know you may have some that you won't be able to move. Okay, um, data sovereignty rules: data must reside in a certain location. Maybe it cannot be in a third party location, such as an AWS. Cost is too prohibitive uh, to move. Uh, it's very complex integration because there's so many touch points. Yeah, these are some reasons why you may say, okay, this system not going to move it. <laughs> We're going to keep it on premises. We're going to keep it, you know, outside of AWS uh, because for these reasons. So there you go. So these are the, the six R's. Now the last one, which is the seventh one, is a hybrid. So you may say, okay, we may combine some of these, uh, you know, approaches. So where some components of the applications are moved to the cloud, where others are kept on premises. Now this is the hybrid. Now, you may say, okay, this is fine, but one thing you do have to understand though, is that um, if they are part of a, um, you know, application that provides business value, the connectivity must be, you know, um, pretty available. So uh, if the, uh, the internet, uh, the, the VPNs uh, and the other ways that you connect to AWS is not reliable enough, then you may have to consider something like a direct connect where you have a dedicated connection into AWS, right? So these are some other consideration, making sure that the connectivity uh, remains steady if you have this kind of hybrid. Okay? And when you are combining, not just the integration, but you're know, combining uh, the cloud with a non-cloud, cloud with on-premises, that also adds complexity and complexity actually is a cause for troubleshooting problems, you know, security problems. So you have to uh, pay extra uh, attention to those issues when you're choosing to do hybrid. Okay. Now it's it's fine and dandy to kind of know about these seven steps, but 
how do you actually do make these decisions, right? Well, AWS actually has a very nice site and a flowchart. So let me show you. So on the left, I've shown you the flowchart. It's kind of small, uh, but so let me get to that site that, that we have it here. So here it is. Here is a website. It's called the Prioritization and Migration Strategy website. Um, but let's see, let me go to the part that I wanted to show you. It's the one that says, oh, here we go. Determining the R type for migration. OK, uh, so there's a website for it. So how do you determine a migration strategy for your application? And here is the flowchart, right? So this flowchart, for example, says, let's see, see if I can see it. Um, right, portfolio data. Uh, assess the application. See, see the very first one says retire. Yes, right. Uh, plan decommission before migration, right? So, so there's a uh, one on the left, top left, the diamond. Uh, plan decommission uh, before migration deadline. So that's you know retiring. Um, yes or no. And then you go for operational complexity, licensing. Is uh, is it caught? All that stuff, right? Replatforming. See about this replatforming, yes or no, right? So yeah, check that out. Um, this may be helpful for you, but in the end, uh, it's going to lead you to one of the six R's, right? Uh, when you um, at the end of this analysis. So you know, this may be a very nice systematic way uh, of going through and deciding uh, your workload uh, as to which strategy you're going to take. Okie dokie. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and get back. into that. So that is the strategies. Now let's move into the last section, explore AWS tools and services that can accelerate the migration process. So these are all the services and tools that are available to you. Some are free, some are self-service, some are not free, uh, some are provided only by the APNs, uh, the um, the AWS uh, partner network, and also um, AWS uh, professional services. Okay, uh, so Here's a list, right? So anyway, migration tools and services. Let, let's actually go back into the cloud migration site just so that you become familiar with this site. So this is the one that I showed you at the beginning, okay? But if you look at the top, you know, there are many tabs, right? So you have, see where it says resources? Yeah, let's go to resources. So here, um, this is where you can go. It's a one-stop place uh, to look at all the resources. And all you do is, you know, create filters on, on the side. Let's say, you know, you're in healthcare um, and some of the products that you may be able to use. Um, but let's see, uh, use cases, let's say Oracle migration, SQL migration. Nope. It's not in healthcare. <laughs> okay, so let's say Oracle migration. So there it is. Uh, so this is how you would use that resource. Okay, and then you also have partners, right? So here, Windows partners, Oracle partners, uh, migration partners, mainframe partners. There's migration uh, competency um, partners. So this is where you would get your uh, resources. Okay, so it's always available to you. But there are other tools, right? So let's go ahead and take a look. I made a compilation of some tools for you uh, based on the three phases of migration. Okay, so here it is. Now I'm not going to go through every single one of these things. Okay, but uh, like I said, I've divided them into the the phases of the migration. So right here on the assess phase. Okay, let just let me just kind of highlight uh, some of these tools. The AWS Migration Hub is something that's available to you once you open up your AWS um, console. So there is a migration hub. And migration hub is actually a pretty unique tool that actually allows you to use it during assessment phase, mobilization phase, and also migration phase, right? So migration hub kind of spans uh, every step uh, of the migration. But especially for assessment phase, it's a one place that you can go to and look at the progress of the migration. Um, and there are some uh, multiple AWS and partner solutions that integrates with it. OK, so it's a pretty nice service. Now, remember, in the assessment phase, you're trying to make a decision whether it makes sense for the businesses to do the migration. So that has a lot to do with total cost of ownership. So AWS, you know, calculators, uh, the prices, uh, how much it's costing you currently uh, on premises and how much it's going to change uh, as you move into AWS is going to be a great tool uh, to present to your businesses. Well, architected tool, this is when you're uh, architecting 
your system into AWS, some of the best practices and design principles that are recommended by AWS. So the, this is almost like the CAF tool that I, sh I showed you, right? Um, uh, is also a very good resource. Uh, cloud economics provides resources to understand cost optimization of moving to the cloud, right? Discovery services, this will discover automatically finds application and their dependencies, right? So these are great tools. Uh, and the uh, migration evaluator uh, provides business of TCO analysis for migration. So these are some of the tools that you can look into. So, you know, just a list, right? So take your time uh, and check it out when you have some, some time. The next one is during the mobilization phase. Now the mobilization phase, remember, you're not really migrating yet, but you're planning for the migration. And this is gonna be like really critical that you have a very detailed planning. Now, um, the AWS landing zone is where uh, most of the customers, when they move into AWS, will create multiple accounts, right? Uh, so landing zone is a way for you to, um, to create multiple accounts based on following the AWS's best practice for running multiple accounts, basically. Okay, so uh, so that if you're not too familiar with well, how, how, how many accounts do I need and you know what do these accounts do and how do I control these accounts? Well, if you take control of the landing zone, you, you can have like a template, right? Uh, for what those uh, accounts should look like and what services that it should be configured with. Anyway, uh, control tower, is more of a easy way to set up and govern new multi-account environments and also take uh, advantage of the landing zone. So uh, Control Tower itself is free, uh, but it's going to create some uh, templated accounts automatically for you, right? So that you don't have to worry about creation of these multiple accounts uh, and all the services that should be centralized. Uh, they'll centralize all that for you, um, but you do of course pay for the resources that you spin up. Now AWS organization is uh, consolidate these uh, AWS account into grouping that you want to manage. So yeah, uh, you know, it's a, um, you, it's, it's about taking multiple accounts that are, that are separate into one um, like a like a group, right? So it's a so you organize, right? And to centrally manage um, multiple accounts. So the organization is um, control towers actually leveraging the organization, and control towers also uh, leverages the landing zone as well. Now single sign-on makes it really easy for you to manage your. Um, sign on into AWS uh, from, let's say, from your on-premises uh, Active Directory. Um, so, you know, if you have on-premises Active Directory and you want those users, the Active Directory users, to be able to uh, seamlessly access AWS as well as other uh, third-party SaaS applications, uh, then uh, single sign-on will be a great service for you. CloudFormation uh, is a tool that AWS offers uh, that uh, that gives you the power of the infrastructure as code, so that you can template creation of your infrastructure just like you write an application. So if you're already familiar with something like Terraform, that is the AWS version, so to speak, uh, of infrastructure as code. It does something very similar to what Terraform does. Okay. And last but not least, um, we have the the migrate phase. Now the migrate phase is where you're actually moving things, right? You're moving your servers, moving your data. And as I mentioned before, if you're moving your entire data center, you know, you probably don't want to be taking the time to sending all that data through the internet. So you probably use something like a data snowball, snowmobile. It's a physical device that you can use. AWS will send it to you so that you can send back the data physically to AWS and AWS will move that data for you uh, into the AWS environment. So data sync, uh, automate the moving of data between on-premises storage and systems. Uh, this is not a physical service. It is a uh, digital service um, and also database migration service. You know, databases are usually part of, normally part of the critical systems that you have. Um, so, you know, you, you can't afford downtime, you can't really afford mistakes, uh, and there are complexities, right? The databases are not that simple to move, especially uh, if you're moving 
not one to one, not from you know one Oracle with the same version to a, exactly the same Oracle into the same version into the cloud. But let's say if you're moving from one version of Oracle to an updated version of Oracle, there may be some um, the transformation that you may have to do to the data and migration data my database migration service as well as the um, looking at make sure that your data dictionaries uh, and your data definitions are also transformed. So all those services are usually considered to be database migration service. Server migration service, right? Allows you to automate and track replication of live server, right? Uh, such as moving into EC2. So you could you can actually don't have to do them manually these days, okay? Uh, transfer family, if you're using something like uh, FTP, uh, secure FTP, uh, FTPS, um, you can go ahead and use those protocols right, uh, and move your data into S3 right, by using something called a transfer family. Elastic Beanstalk is if you have a traditional three-tier application or you have an application that is going to be combined with the simple queue service, right? then Elastic Beanstalk will help you in creating uh, it's a pod solution that actually allows you to deploy and run applications of those two types, right? Three tier application and application that's that's going to be using the uh, the SQS. Okay. Um, cloud endure migration, migration of application from physical, virtual, and cloud based uh, into AWS, as well as application migration service. Um, so this is moving the legacy application to the cloud. So these are some of the migration. Uh, tools they use for migration phase there are others as well right so i'm just kind of uh pick uh, the the prominent one for you but just check it out and see uh, and also um you know consult with your um provider uh and perhaps you have some consulting partners uh or professional service partners and see what kind of tools they may be able to offer you okay all right so that basically completes the migration service and tools as I say, I uh, uh, separate them into assessment phase, right, mobilization phase, and the migrate phase. Uh, and you can go to that website and see, you know, what what else is new, right? And also look at the uh, the uh, AWS marketplace and see if there are other tools that are offered by the third party uh, for your particular needs. All right, so that completes my content. Now I am open to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Tarumi. That was very informative. I know everyone is looking forward to the Q&A session, so go ahead and start putting your questions into the questions panel. And now I'd like to give the presentation rights over to Remy, our vendor manager, to introduce our promotions and webinar-related courses. Thank you so much. And once again, a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined our today's session now I would like to take you all through some of our handpicked resources, which we think will immensely help in accelerating your learning journey on AWS. Starting off with a quick overview of Netcom Learning um, and what sets us apart from the other uh, cloud training leaders. Uh, we have very recently been recognized by trainingindustry.com as one of the top 20 IT training companies in the US. Um, another major driver of our expertise is our 25 plus years of industry presence. We have been able to service over these last uh, 25 years to over 80% of the Fortune 500 companies in both the B2B as well as the B2G space. Now, we just wanted to mention that this session is being recorded. Uh, so in case you want to refer back to any of the topics that will be covered during uh, the today's session, uh, we will be sharing the recording with you uh, later on so you can um, access the recording through that link. Moving to the recommended courses, uh, which we think will best suit your learning journey. What you see right now are some of our upcoming training badges on the top courses, which you can register for. The dates have been mentioned, but in case you have any queries regarding the same, you can at any time reach out to our team. We also have a mix of the most relevant resources, which will help you get a better understanding on some of the other AWS courses. 
Moving on to the AWS skilling program. Uh, so this helps you to develop broad based cloud skills uh, working side by side our champion level AWS authorized instructors who train cloud professionals on the latest AWS technologies and tools. So now as a part of the program, you and your organization both uh, may also be eligible for pre AWS certification exam vouchers and extended lab facilities that extend up to five weeks after the completion of the training. Now we are excited to also bring to you the AWS Skill Builder, which is a new learning center with 600 plus free digital courses with, that is built by the AWS experts. This includes the game-based learning opportunities with CloudQuest and team-based competition with Gen. Its unique set of offerings actually include practical real-world and hands-on lab experiences in a live AWS environment. Now, this is something that we personally love because it showcases the effort that the AWS team takes to make the learning as fun and immersive for the learners. Moving on, um, another big announcement that we have for our learners today and something that I had given a hint in the previous uh, in one of the previous slides is about our ongoing discount fest which as a part of which you can now choose the AWS training which suits your job role and uh, you can enroll yourself at almost half of the original price. Please note that this offer is applicable only on the course trainings and not on the course certifications and the last day to enroll for this is September 30th. Moving on, um, our free AWS e-learning resources follow a self-paced training model wherein you get the liberty of accessing extensive course related videos that are delivered by the AWS subject matter experts on the go. So uh, that uh, these videos cover the availability on the device of your choice. So you can access them from your laptop, from your uh, tablet, from your phones as well. So please feel free to access these free resources and make the most out of them. Additionally, uh, please feel free to register for a demo to get an idea on what are two our private group trainings on AWS entails. Now these trainings will be delivered by our AWS authorized instructors with an agenda of understanding the different AWS services and solution and will be beneficial for you to devise a roadmap as per your team's current learning needs. The Amazon Web Services Learning Needs Analysis, which we also call as AWS LNA. Now, this is a free self-assessment tool that helps you identify your organization's cloud skills gap. That includes the participating employees to complete an adaptive e-survey that takes no more than 15 minutes, depending on the role. The idea here is to come up with a targeted cost effective training and certification plan that's right for your organization and addresses the specific needs of your employees. Moving on, uh, we have the Learning Passport Next, which is a flexible team training package specifically designed and customized for the number of learners you have. The Learning Passport is redeemable across our entire portfolio, which covers more than 4,000 official courses valid over 12 months. Now we have an exciting solution for you, um, which is Netcom Plus Learning Subscription uh, that is there for our enterprise customers. So all you need to do here is to pay one time and you get unlimited access to authorized training from top vendors that includes AWS for a span of 12 months, which is one year. Currently, we have three packages available. You can get started for free with a silver pack, the one that you see uh, uh, on the first block which allows you access to uh, more than 300 learning modules. You can upgrade to the gold pack for just $199 and access 400 plus learning modules in addition to the silver pack benefits. And lastly, we highly recommend our most popular offering of all and ideal for our uh, enterprise customers, which is the platinum package that can be unlocked if you have more than 10 learners. Now, in terms of the benefits, it gives you access to 400 plus learning modules and 100 plus virtual instructor led courses across top vendors. So it's a great offering that Netcom, that Netcom team has curated just for our learners. So um, if you require the details, we will be sharing all the details with you, the links with you. Please uh, take some time to go through them. And if you are interested, uh, uh, we have our team that can uh, uh, that can answer any of your qu queries that you might have around the learner subscription.
Now, in addition to our custom programs, uh, do feel free to also go through some of our additional resources, which are curated, uh, keeping the learners' needs in demand. And let us know uh, learners' needs in mind. And let us know in the comments if you have any recommendations for us with respect to coming up with uh, more such assets. Now, apart from our virtual sessions, you can also catch the relevant updates related to IT and business training through our social media handles. So please feel free to follow us on all uh, uh, for all the latest updates. Now, lastly, the CEO of Netcom Learning is an avid reader, uh, writer, and you can check out a glimpse of his book, which is a practical actionable guide on how to boost performance, successfully manage change and innovate more quickly. Thank you. Thanks so much for guiding us through that information, Remy. And now we're going to go ahead and jump right into our question and answer session. First question is, how can I migrate the workloads from my physical machines to AWS? Okay, hey, thank you for asking that question. Um, now, to migrate the workload, uh, in the presentation I've covered, you know, different types of workload uh, and different uh, tools that you can use as well right so you so if it's a server let's say right so if it's a physical server uh and you're moving your application workload into another server in aws you could use something called the aws server migration service right aws server migration service now aws server migration service is an agentless option okay uh that that will migrate your application from one server physical server into uh to the AWS uh, you know, server on AWS. Now for more complex needs, um, you could use Cloud Endure migration. Okay. They both allow you to automate and manage the migration process, right? And because we are talking about large migration, right? So that you, you want to avoid manual process as much as possible. Now, these applications will probably also have data sets. So you, you might want to use, if it's big enough, you may want to use, uh, you know, Snowball. Uh, if not, uh, you know, you could use other uh, transport tools as well that I covered in the tools. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Let's take another question. How can I migrate the databases from on-premises data center to AWS? Okay, great, thank you. So. Um, in one of the, the, the slides that I explained that uh, something called the database migration service, right? So you can use AWS database migration service, and that gives you really a seamless migration of database to AWS. It's really, really nice. So you could do a one-time uh, migration, or you could do a continuous replication of data by using the uh, database migration service. But for more complex needs, like a real-time replication, uh, you could use a DMS, right, database migration service, along with something called the schema conversion tool. So the schema conversion tool is what transforms one uh, schema, right? So if you're a database person, you know, you probably understand what schema is, right? So you take schema of your on-premises and converts it over into the schema that you need for the database on, on the cloud side. Okay. So you were used in combination with the schema conversion tool and the data migration service, right? So once again, on the data set side, uh, for a very large database, you may want to use Snowball or Snowmobile uh, to move, you know, physical transfer of the data. And then you can just go ahead and start the migration from there. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that uh, should give you a good start on how you move your database uh, into AWS. Hope that answers your, uh, your question. And let's take one last question before we wrap it up. What's the difference between AWS organization and control tower? Right, so I briefly covered that uh, on the, the tools again, but let me go ahead and reiterate. The AWS organization actually allows you to centrally manage you know, multiple accounts, right? Uh, and when I say centrally manage, we, you know, what are we talking about here? So um, each account has a billing requirement, like you know, credit card, right? Uh, so AWS organization allows you to man you know, centrally manage uh, billing, so consolidated billing. Uh, you can centrally control access to these um, uh, AWS accounts uh, using policies across multiple AWS accounts. So it's it's relatively you know easy to manage multiple accounts uh, using this, right? Now, so that's the organization. Uh, 
AWS Control Tower is built on top of the organization. Remember I told you, right? So the Control Tower leverages the organization. So it, it provides additional governance and compliance and best practice. And in the major part that I see about Control Tower is that it's automatically set these things up for you. Right? Sets up all the necessary accounts that you need to manage other accounts. So Control Tower is more of an automation and it's an automated landing zone. Remember, landing zone is a, is a template, right? So Control Tower is more of an automated landing zone for setting up a well-architected multiple account environment. So if you don't have experience with AWS or if you don't have experience with managing um, multiple accounts on AWS, then using uh, control Tower will assure that whatever you do create uh, is aligned with the best practice uh, that AWS uh, has to offer. I hope that uh, answers your question. Once again, I want to remind you that as you leave the session today, you will be presented with a short survey. We would like to request for you to help us by taking a quick moment to participate in that survey. Your feedback really helps us understand your learning experience as we are constantly looking at how we can improve our future sessions. The survey answers are measured on a scale of one to five, five representing outstanding and one representing poor. We wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And if you do come up with any additional questions, feel free to send them to webinar at netcomlearning.com at any time. We hope that you found today's webinar informative and we look forward to seeing you back here with us soon. Feel free to tell your friends and colleagues about our webinars and other courses. Have a great day, everyone.